Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amy Navickas Brash. I'm an engineering manager at Osborne Consulting, and I'll be the moderator for this panel discussion. I'd like to start off by introducing the panelists. Um, we have Trey George. He is an environmental analyst for the city of Spokane, responsible for ensuring that the conditions of the Eastern Washington Phase Two Stormwater Municipal Permit are met through coordination with the city's departments and interactions with Washington State Department of Ecology. He has been with the city of Spokane for almost two years and prior to that spent 13 years performing all aspects of stormwater compliance in the forest products and chemical manufacturing industrial sectors in addition to consulting. Next we have Tony Gilbertson. He is a developmental services program manager for clean water services. He manages an oversight program to ensure clean water services and the seven large cities in Washington County are in compliance with performance standards for operation and maintenance of sanitary and stormwater infrastructure. He and his team are also responsible for managing the district's inspection program of privately owned water quality facilities and providing oversight and training opportunities to ensure compliance with state and local erosion control regulations. Tony has worked at Clean Water Services for 25 years. Next, we have Tyler Palmer. He is the Deputy City Supervisor overseeing public works and services for the City of Moscow. He received a bachelor's degree from Weber State University and a master's degree in public administration from the University of Idaho. Tyler has worked in various positions in his 17 years in public works. He is a Jennings Randolph International Fellow and a member of the Government Affairs Committee of the American Public Works Association. And last but not least, we have Drina, Drina Donofino, um, Green Infrastructure Asset Manager for Seattle Public Utilities. She's been working in green stormwater infrastructure asset management since 2006. She focuses on cradle to grave oversight and management of SPU owned assets and has a passion for continuous project improvement, designing for maintenance and safety and strives to ensure community equity in neighborhoods with GSI facilities. Her team manages green assets built on utility owned facilities or the right of way and oversees asset onboarding for capital projects, along with other agency led projects, stormwater code driven and voluntary projects. Currently she is active with ASCE, the National GI Exchange Organization, WEF and APWA. Uh, next, we're going to play a video that the city of Spokane created to introduce field workers and citizens to their green area maintenance program. The video provides an overview of the city's inspection and maintenance practices for stormwater treatment areas and discussion about the city's big picture goals for protecting the region's unique water resources, including the Spokane River and the sole source drinking water aquifer. Can you please play the video? So stormwater is mother nature at its best. As the rain comes, it picks up all those pollutants and carries them into some kind of stormwater area. If we maintain these things, they will last longer. They're the what's really doing the work for us. So as long as we take care of them, they'll take care of us. It's keeping that runoff from entering our storm system and ending up in the Spokane River or in the aquifer. That's really why we want to have these treatment areas and why we want to keep them functioning to protect those. We have all of our different sites around the city that we manage. Major concern is like flooding, getting rid of excess storm water or drain water. We also get rid of a lot of the trash that's put into these that's usually flowed from the water. We're looking for trash, garbage, leaves, weeds. Make sure the water can flow on the edges and the, and the outlets. Don't flood the corners. So we're going to make it look better and work the way it's supposed to at the same time. And I think it's really important that everybody comes in together to make sure that we're keeping the aquifer as clean as possible and keeping the Spokane River as clean as possible. I mean, it's a recreational asset. It's an important piece of, of the city of Spokane. So stormwater treatment BMPs, best management practices, uh, generally are swales, evaporation ponds, infiltration ponds, rain gardens, which are very similar to swales, or bioinfiltration cell. A swale is a really simple bioinfiltration cell. A uh, swale has low sloping walls and it has an inlet and an outlet. Uh, sometimes it's a, a dry well instead of an outlet, not an outfall. A bioinfiltration cell is very much like a swale, except it doesn't look like a ditch. It'll have steep walls and you can put it on a smaller footprint. 
You can use grasses still, but you can also include some other creative uh, vegetation, uh, drought tolerant bushes and plants, um, small trees. With the pond, you have an inlet, the pond, and then oftentimes uh, the water doesn't exit the pond, there's no outfall, it'll infiltrate or evaporate. Other features you'll see in creative green areas, well, such as rain gardens, you'll see cool rock formations or you'll, you'll see terracing that doesn't necessarily provide more treatment uh, for the stormwater, but it provides a beautification aspect to the green area that makes it more lucrative to have in your neighborhood. And so there's no limit to what you can do. As long as you have your inlet, your treatment area, and your outfall or infiltration area, those are the critical things to have, but you can add anything that beautifies it as much as you want. Yeah, 33-2. 32, where's that at in the city? For green area maintenance facilities to be successful and meet their longevity for lifetime, from the design phase to the construction phase to the maintenance phase, there has to be a clear communication between all stakeholders. And stakeholders are city departments, city employees, private citizens, uh, companies, and determine what's best for that area um, that's going to make sense long term that meets the needs of both the community and the city. From the time of design, we are thinking about operation and maintenance and how this stormwater treatment area is going to be designed, but we also want to lay out an operation and maintenance plan for this stormwater treatment area that can be passed on to the property owner or the city, whoever the owner is for the stormwater treatment area, so that it's clear what needs to be done in terms of inspection and maintenance and also lay out responsibility, because that can be one of the items that keeps things from getting inspected and maintained. I think the most important thing that we've learned is really just talking about these projects. We want to make sure that we're not setting our maintenance uh, crews up for failure by making something that's too small or too difficult for them to maintain. When we plan and design a stormwater facility, we want to make sure that we're meeting the water quality goals, the water quantity goals, and we want to design something that's cost effective too. The public-private partnerships are incredibly helpful to us because they a lot of times allow us to achieve our water quality and quantity goals uh, without spending more money than we would otherwise. I mean I'd use the example of, of the Olmstead Brothers Green facility that we did at Kendall Yards. This is a facility that essentially begins over on the Monroe Street Bridge just to our east here. We've got a pump facility that pumps all the way down this street here and we've got three of these structures right here where the pump stormwater bubbles up out of them flows down this set of weirs and runs out into the grass field over here. And that grass field is what gives us our infiltration and treatment for this facility. If that should ever fill up, what would happen then is the stormwater would flow underneath the bridge over this way, and we've got some dry wells just downstream from there that handles those major storm events. We don't have a lot of maintenance dollars, so anytime we can partner with a private entity to help us with that maintenance, it's a huge win for both the city and the private developer. They are in big investment in terms of um, design, in terms of installation, in terms of maintenance. Um, so we want those to last as long as possible. Another challenge we're finding is just quantifying operation and maintenance over a long-term period. So we kind of have a representative of what it might take to like clean out a catch basin, mow a swale. And those numbers even vary depending on where the VMP is located. So if it's on a main thoroughfare and you want it to look extra nice, that's going to take more work than, say, just a swale in someone's parking lot. So actually quantifying the personnel needed for operation and maintenance and the equipment needed, um, that's a good amount of work just in itself. The requirements that are set forth by ecology to, uh, to perform maintenance are, are increasing. And so as the city grows, you have more stormwater treatment facilities. As the regulations uh, grow, you have more requirements on your stormwater treatment facilities, and so you need to project moving forward what your staffing and equipment needs are gonna be so you can adequately meet your compliance requirements, but on, on the same line, also treat the water so that you have proper water quality treatment so our river and our aquifer are protected. There's gonna be some pretty common maintenance actions that you could do regardless of what the stormwater treatment area type is. The main one is just making sure that the inlet and outlet structures are clean. So removing any sediment or material like trash, leaves, whatever, that's keeping water from entering those. Items that might require more frequent maintenance or trimming, removing any noxious weeds, and mowing or thinning any vegetation that's in the stormwater treatment areas. Those tasks are important to keep things looking nice as well as vegetation healthy. Our crews will go out and they'll you know, do the weeding, the mowing, Make sure the irrigation system's working properly if it's a if it's a grass facility. Clean inlets, 
make sure grass isn't dying, make sure things aren't plugged with trash. Over the long haul, if the stormwater treatment areas aren't maintained or if these small maintenance tasks aren't performed, you can end up with larger problems that are more difficult or more expensive to repair or fix, say sediment material, especially fine material entering your stormwater treatment area, it can end up clogging that top layer, limiting the infiltration. This is an example of how important it is to maintain sediment uh, as it comes out of our pipes. You can see this is a, this is a four bay that we have here, which is working well um, up to a certain point. You can see it builds up in here and then you'll notice you'll notice there's a stripe where the sediment's just getting washed out um, when we have a storm flush through this pipe. So that washout is then all going into the lawn over here and has since turned into cattails, which is still working great from a stormwater perspective. Um, the only issue is that it continues to grow um, and, and essentially we just need to thin these cattails out and rehab this facility a little bit to make it function more like um, it was designed to. So removing that top layer of fine sediment can be a lot more effort than just removing a pile every once in a while or having to replace vegetation because water is ponding. That can be a little bit more effort than just coming in and trimming and mowing. Visual inspection, which is going to be most, the most common type of inspection we're going to be doing, is going to give us indicators if there are any issues or if the stormwater treatment area is functioning as it's intended or as it was designed. So if we go out and do a visual inspection, we might see there's no vegetation anymore in our bioretention area. There's ponded water. Those are gonna be things that tell us there's something wrong. This isn't working like it's supposed to be. Typically what I like to see in terms of foliage is a lot of what the original plantings were. What I don't typically wanna see is really thin vegetation or a lot of like noxious weeds. Thin vegetation can be an indicator of uh, ponding. There's like a little pile of sediment, which is kind of odd that it's all the way over here, far away from the inlet, which makes me think it might have been just put there. This looks like water might be overflowing over the weir and then dropping out sediment right here. So this would be another thing I'd probably remove. The sediment can block flow from coming in, but it can also block flow from infiltrating in, especially if there's a lot of fines. Um, and I would expect that that might be an issue if that were allowed to continue. And then there are a lot of leaves. <laughs> that might be worth taking out as well. What you inspect for depends on the BMP, but generally there's some typical things to look for. The first one when you arrive on site is to look for any physical damage or vandalism. It's also important to take a look at the inlet and outlet structures, whatever those are, if they're a curb cut or maybe a catch basin. We wanna make sure that those are at full capacity, that there's not material blocking those or keeping water from entering the stormwater treatment area or from leaving the stormwater treatment area. We also wanna look for erosion for any deposition as well, because those can be indicators that water is ponding and depositing amounts of sediment or in the case of erosion, maybe water is entering the stormwater treatment area too quickly and we want to add some energy dissipation. A green area used for stormwater treatment can be a ditch in front of someone's home. It can be a large facility that the city has built on a large lot. They all need to be maintained with the, the very simple principles. The general worker needs a mixture of tools to perform maintenance on a stormwater facility, from general yard care tools to light construction tools. If the treatment facility uh, vegetation is grass, you need a mower or a weed eater or something similar. Uh, you'll see a lot of trash that's blown in off the road from wind. It's also transported by stormwater into the facility. So bring gloves, bring trash bags, bring your lawnmower, bring your rakes. We've got a great bunch of maintenance people here to help clean these facilities, mow these facilities, and try to take care of them. I can't even give you a number of how many uh, miles of, of green area that we are, are maintaining. And everybody takes such great pride in what they're doing, and they do such a great job. I'm proud to be um, in charge of these guys. They're great. What I like about this job is I live here. You go around, you see a lot of clear spots. I did that, and that makes me proud. This is my town. I want it to look good. It's pretty cool to really see the impact that you're making on the town, to be able to see your work actually come into effect in your life. 
I think it's really important for everybody to be involved in this. It is in everybody's best interest to maintain these facilities, whether it's a city or whether it's a private homeowner or a developer even. We put these things in place so that we can save both the aquifer and the river, and I think it's really important. There's a lot of really good ideas coming from municipalities who are just figuring this out, a lot of hard work. Knowing the amount of research that's going into this, knowing the amount of talking that's going into this, this is something that I'm confident we can learn more about and that we can figure out a good solution or many good solutions to provide operation and maintenance for our stormwater treatment areas. We got this. <laughs>
that would educate landscape maintenance contractors and proper inspection uh, assessment and management of vegetative facilities. Uh, in 2014, I was able to take advantage of an opportunity to work with a professor at PCC, Portland Community College. Uh, it came to us on an internship funded by the national uh, grant from the National Science Foundation. Uh, this is really important because his expertise as a professional educator, you know, was, was really significant. And he also owned a maintenance company uh, at one point to the uh, landscape maintenance company. So uh, we developed a, a really good working relationship and partnership. Uh, in 2015, we rolled out our first training. Um, the professor was also uh, the chair of the landscape maintenance department at PCC. So we added it to their uh, environmental landscape management program as a one credit class. The main reason for the training was to educate contractors, but I soon discovered that uh, there were just as many municipalities that were interested in the training uh, as a result of the new phase two permit requirements, uh, MS4 permit requirements. So one of the incentives for the contractors to take the training and pass the exam was that we added their name to a preferred contractor list that we distributed to private property owners. Uh, due to the high demand for the training, the fact that we were held to class size no more than about 30 people, uh, we decided that converting the in-person training to an online version was the next logical thing to do. So that's what we did. Uh, during the in-person training, I received a lot of feedback from attendees requesting Spanish training. Uh, so that was something that was <clears throat> that we had interest in. And something that was also notable and, and, and somewhat concerning to me was on, on a personal level was that some of the bilingual Hispanic attendees didn't come back for the exam on the final day of the training. And when I asked why, uh, I was told that it was due to a, a language barrier. So although they spoke English, they didn't understand it well enough because it wasn't their primary language and they feared they wouldn't be able to pass the exam. So taking the training online uh, one step further, we decided to offer it in Spanish, which uh, you know, re required us to translate the English script into uh, Spanish, which we've done. And then to ensure the proper industry terminology was used, we decided to partner with one of our larger um, landscape maintenance contractors in our area to review the script. Uh, one thing that, that we learned through this process was that the majority of the uh, Hispanic workers employed with the uh, landscaping industry uh, came, up from, came from a region in, in central Mex Mexico uh, that had their own dialect of, of Spanish. So simply translating the English script into Spanish may not be as effective as what we would hoped. <clears throat> so um, probably the most important element of this partnership is to ensure that our target audience can understand the training. Otherwise, we could miss our goal as well as an opportunity to help the population of people that don't have any other opportunities for training of any kind, let alone something uh, that can help them in their careers. So this is important to us as clean water services in general um, and, and myself as well. This has been a, a, a very fun and extremely gratifying project to work on. And at this point, we're rolling, hoping to roll the, the training out sometime this late summer. Uh, COVID has certainly impacted our ability to, to meet and, and work through the challenges of this, but we're hoping to do that. So, um, and I'm happy to send out an uh, announcement for those who are interested in the, in the Spanish training, uh, as well as the uh, English version. Great. Trey, a question for you popped up in the chat box. Um, will the video, the city's video be available to others um, through a link that they could share? Yes, absolutely. If you go to spokanestormwater.org, um, it'll, it'll route you to our city's website where we have a couple videos currently. Uh, the video we just saw will be up there by the end of this week, hopefully, but it's not up there today. Okay. Spokanestormwater.org. Drina, can you tell us about the education and outreach program that Seattle Public Utilities has developed, including the motivation to create a career path for those who attend the training? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, so SPU currently manages over about 10 acres of vegetative bioretention in the right away and on SPU facilities. And we're kind of unique because we're such a large municipality that we have multiple crews that perform O&M depending on their skill set. And in 2007, we realized the vision of adjacent property owners maintaining and performing maintenance wasn't meeting the functional needs of the asset. And so we were lucky enough to partner 
with the Seattle Conservation Corps to maintain our facilities. And this was a win-win for us and for our communities. And to give you a, a brief background, the Conservation Corps is a part of Seattle Parks and Rec and the GSI facilities that we manage and are driven by stormwater code or capital projects are in the public utility division. So we partnered with them. The Conservation Corps was established in about 1986 and it's a unique program that provides employment for people experiencing homelessness and gives adults the opportunity to train and work in a structured program. And this also helps them <clears throat> with job skills and helps them carry out projects that benefit our community members and our environment. So it's a year round um, employment program and they have an annual budget of about $4 million, which is about 1 million of that is supported from our GSI budget uh, for the maintenance that they perform for us in the retrofit work. Um, each core member is assigned an individual performance contract and they agree to a one year employment at least. It also provides them with education and life skill development. Each member joins a crew averaging about five members and they are paired up with an experienced staff a supervisor or crew lead to oversee the work that they do. We're really lucky our crew manager um, has over 25 years of experience of working with the city of Seattle. He's a landscape architect and horticulturist. So he's well educated and has a lot of uh, field experience as well in design and office work as far as managing GSI. Um, so we pair up the crews with um, the crew manager and they work five days a week. And then after hours, they are also offer, uh, offered opportunities in our learning center. And um, they have opportunities to get their GED or take online training or meet with additional people to help them um, move through the challenges that are in their life. Um, our, our, our crews uh, lean, learn green job skills like plant identification, right plant, right place, um, proper planting zones for the plants and our bioretention facilities um, and how the facilities are affected by uh, adjacent property use in both commercial, residential and industrial areas. They also do the obvious um, maintenance of weeding, watering, pruning, mulching, debris removal, and then they also manage other site specific logistics, which can be very complex, um, as was alluded to earlier in the presentation, with um, how to know how to know what the how the the adjacent property uses um, how they're interacting with the facilities and where the location is. Basically, they're trying to keep all of or all or most of our citizens happy. Um, most of our facilities, again, like was discussed earlier, front our citizens' home. So we have this delicate dance of managing aesthetics, personal preference versus maintaining for function. And then also the risk associated with the adjacent property owners performing um, creative work or sometimes damaging work in the swale that can be detrimental or destructive. So we do our best to keep our customers and our citizens happy to ensure that um, our systems remain functioning. Some of the big benefits of our crews um, are working with the public in a diverse environment, tracking, learning skills besides weeding and watering, some of the more typical standard uh, skill set that you would expect. Um, they learn strong customer service, service skills and communication. <clears throat> Excuse me. They also have, like I said before, the opportunity to get their GED basic, basic math and reading skills. We also provide both classroom and field training from experts in the field on things like how do you work with a permitted site, ordinary high water mark identification, New Zealand mud snail, snail um, um, decon decontamination, um, recognizing them. So working around sensitive areas. Um, they also get technical skills related to specific projects like um, how do you use the proper power tools, um, or even fish removal. Some of the other life skills that they learn are money management, nutrition, conflict resolution, job readiness, job search, job preparation, and 
resume writing and interview skills. Um, the core members receive a minimum wage and they all receive a case management service, including mental health counseling and drug and alcohol recovery. And best yet, at the end of their enrollment, they receive help moving into permanent positions. About 80% leave with stable housing, 90% leave with long-term employment. And the most important part for me is how we network with them to partner with our stormwater crews and give them experiences out in the field and then help move them, help move them into paths within the utility for well-paying job, paying jobs with great benefits. Our most recent success was one of our team leads um, <clears throat> applied for our water pipe apprenticeship and she was accepted and now she's working in our water line of business. Thank you. Yeah. Tyler, I'm gonna jump to you. I understand the city of Moscow was issued a new NPDES MS4 permit in October, 2019, and that the city was going to start collecting fees to fund the stormwater utility. However, due to COVID, the city decided to delay the new fee to not burden the public with that additional cost. I also understand the EPA has not changed any of the permit deadlines due to COVID. Can you tell us about some of the creative ways the city has been able to meet their permit requirements without these additional fees? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Amy. Uh, yeah, you know, it was uh, something that we we knew we were going to be listed for quite some time. Um, the, the state of Idaho pursued primacy fairly recently, they were granted in July of 2018 primacy. Um, but as part of the state's uh, agreement with the EPA, Region 10, Region 10 agreed that they would eliminate their backlog of permits. And ours was one of those permits that was backlogged with Region 10. And so we, uh, we received our permit in October of 2019. It went into effect and we had plans to launch our utility in October of 2020. Um, things were going pretty smoothly. Uh, we have a community here. Uh, I think many of you are probably familiar with the University of Idaho is located here in Moscow. Um, the nature of the community is uh, fairly environmentally conscious. And so they were in favor of making sure that we were we had a, a good program to manage our stormwater. Um, we'd already we'd already done a lot of work toward that. Ordinances had been drafted, initial initial outreach had already been conducted. We already had estimates for costs and then started our outreach with some of the big, more impacted users. Um, and then as you stated, Amy, COVID hit, changed. So at, at that point, there wasn't a big appetite to go and add a fee uh, across the board for our residents, a fairly significant fee for the university and some of our commercial users. And so at that point, we were instructed to look for ways to try and delay it for another year. And, um, you know, it, it was, it, it's something that we weren't going to get a delay in the requirements of the permit uh, or relief in that area. And so we really had to sit down and take a look at all the per provisions in the permit and say, okay, which ones can we continue? What can we do? What can we do with our current staff so that uh, we don't overly compress the, the, the provisions of the permit into the last two years now of what will be left in the permit. And so, you know, some of the things that we're able to continue with existing city staff and enhance to the level that with provisions of our permit, things like our enhanced street sweeping, catch basin cleaning, um, our right of way trimming program, uh, our dry weather uh, outfall screening was something that we were able to do shuffling with some internal staff in our environmental services department and have them uh, make sure that we keep up on that process. Um, we also were able to do our public outreach and education plan. Um, we've got some internal staff that works on that for uh, water conservation, for sanitation, recycling. Um, so we were able to uh, leverage resources in that area to try and keep that going. And so we've got some lesson plans that are under, that have been developed and we will be rolling out um, this spring. Um, we developed our website, our stormwater management plan. Um, and we'll also be starting this winter to look at construction standards and best management practices um, for our construction and off control. Um, another thing that we're gonna be working on is uh, is will likely submit an alternative control measure request to the EPA um, in 2021 for uh, our retention standard that our permit. Um, given our skills that we've got here, we're not sure how feasible the retention standard that we were given is. Um, so, uh, and then just the tracking and responding to complaints. And so those are all things that we're able to keep doing and try and shuffle people around. We're still gonna be hard pressed to meet the rest of the permit in the final years. and. Uh, and so we really are working on making sure that we have a good plan to 
do that quickly and, and leverage those resources and be able to move fast. Uh, we are launching a utility in October of 2021, um, and we started our public outreach associated with that. And so fingers crossed we get a vaccine going and we get this thing under control and we can get that moving. Great. Thank you. And I'm going to jump to a question from one of the attendees uh, for all of you. Um, do any of the speakers have feedback for designers or on do's or don'ts based on O and M for yeah. feedback for designers? Go ahead, Tyler. Okay. And one of the things that we run into and that our, our staff has always really been concerned with is just considering site access. Um, if, if, it, if something's going to require a bigger piece of equipment to maintain, uh, making sure that there's a way to access it. If it's going to require a mower, having some way to get a mower to it. If it's going to require a, a, an excavator at different periods, having the ability to get that or a vacuum truck or something. Just considering what equipment will be needed and, and access of that equipment. And I would add to that, uh, the designers, talk to your maintenance crew, get your maintenance crew or their supervisors in the design phase very, very early. Uh, Cause that's where the rubber hits the road. Reality meets theory, if you will. Um, the maintenance folks will have valuable input for the designers and will help design along the way. Um, that, that the communication between all stakeholders along the entire design process to implementation is key. Thank you. I, and just to add to that, what Trey said, I think that is, that is so important because the buy-in of the people who have to maintain it will have a huge impact on the long-term feasibility of the facility. And so it may, it may end up looking the exact same way, but they feel like they were involved in the process and that they were part of, of putting the plan together, then they'll be invested in that maintenance and that proper maintenance happening rather than feeling like something just got dumped on them that they're struggling to maintain. Great. Um, so Kyle, I wanted to ask you about Oh, another question open to all of you is, can you share with us some of your asset management challenges, lesson learns, and maybe examples of solutions? I, I suppose I could jump in there. One of the challenges that we had um, and, that, and one of the things that we're really hoping to get launched pre-COVID was, was doing a really adequate uh, analysis and, and uh, inspection of our system. Uh, the, the maintenance of our system has been largely actionary for the last, you know, since the late 1800s when it was started to be installed. And so we really have, we have, we have decent mapping, but that's, you know, a lot of times when we go out to verify what's out there, it's not what's out there. Um, and so the asset management piece is something that we're, we really are trying to get in place right up front so that we can build out an adequate capital plan. At this point, we've got placeholders and a lot of assumptions in our capital plan. But as we go out, that'll be something that we, we do have a program that we're using. Um, uh, it's called a next gen and, and asset management and work order management software. And so we'll be using we'll be using that as we go out and do that initial cleaning inspection and uh, and uh, documenting of the system uh, to make sure that we have really good uh, documentation of the assets so that we can build out an adequate plan. I guess Maybe I, I would add that. Um, some of our challenges with asset management and tracking are the sediment issues. And it kind of goes back to the previous question that was asked, uh, what information could you give to designers? It's also an issue for asset management tracking and inspection is where is the sediment building up? How do you remove it? When is it, when is it, um, when is it time to remove that sediment? And how do you track that in your work management system? You know, you may have your swale in your work management system, but you don't want to have your crews inspecting those uh, inlets or your sediment, um, where your sediment is um, being routine. Um, you'd like to have it be more strategic. And so we're trying to adaptively manage and try to figure out how to document just that one area where we may have issues um, along with the inlets and cobbles. Um, so that's been a challenge for us. Anybody else want to add to that? Somebody else was jumping in before, Tony? Yeah, Amy, this, uh, so we just recently uh, moved our private water quality facility program into a, a maintenance management system called Lucidy. Uh, I, think, I think it's really important for us anyway, because we only inspect, at least currently, 25% of our 
private water quality facilities each year is to really document uh, each one of your inspections thoroughly and any correspondence you have with property owners, updating property owner information is important. Uh, you know, businesses sell, uh, homes sell uh, frequently. And so I think just documentation of all of your inspections and any management practices that went along, problems that you've seen uh, each time you go out and do your inspections to see if they're reoccurring, um, you know, noting when you send out educational material to property owners so that uh, they're aware of what, what type of maintenance should be, should be done. Uh, sending out appropriate uh, um, inspection O&M guides, uh, all of that stuff should be documented so that, that, you know, you've got that record and can reflect on it. Um, speaking of maintenance and scheduling, um, med maintenance scheduling and tracking programs, uh, Tyler or um, a trade, do you want to talk about uh, what this, your cities are doing with that? So um, here in Spokane, um, we, we have some room to grow uh, in our asset, ma our asset management with respect to BMPs. Um, they're all getting maintained, they're getting maintained appropriately. Um, our tracking uh, is where we need to grow. Um, a, a preventative maintenance program like I've used uh, back in industry, I think would be perfect that our water department actually uses for our, our drinking water assets. I think if you treated our stormwater assets much like you treated equipment with a, a preventative maintenance program and had it digital and trackable and traceable, uh, and, and that's your documentation right there, I think that would be um, wonderful. And I hope to help the city get to that point. Uh, currently, we're still using pen and paper practices and hard files um, for a lot of our inspections and, and maintenance tracking. Um, and it's, it's a cultural shift for a lot of these folks who have been with the city 20, 30 years doing this. So it's getting over that culture hump uh, and bringing it into the, the 21st century. And then, you know, finding the correct program to track our assets and then uh, implement training and implementing that. So it's, it's not a small task, um, but that's, that's the challenge we're faced with right now. For us, uh, as I mentioned, we did, we did purchase software and it was, it's not just specific to storm. It is something that we use ubiquitously for our utility management. So it's used in our water, our sewer, our fleet, the tree. Um, so that's been helpful. We're small enough that there is overlap. You know, we do end up helping each other in different areas. Um, but having the one software that we're using for it so that we can have we, we bring in one group to do training. All of our administrative assistants become familiar with the software platform. And even so, as Trey said, you know, that transition, it, it's, it's tough, you know, getting people to get away from the sticky note method of doing things. Um, and, and really a big part of us was our staff are so reliant on what they put in. You know, the best system in the world is only as good as the information that, that gets fed into it. And so helping them understand how they benefit, how their job is easier because of it, because initially it doesn't seem that way. Initially it's, okay, now I got to take this iPad out in the field and now I've got to fill out this paperwork or it was just my supervisor said, hey, do this, I went and did it and I was done. And so it, it's one of the big challenges was helping them to, the, the we bono question, how, how do they benefit? And, and once we get, got over that hurdle where they could see the benefit to them and how it made their lives easier, um, that became a lot, a lot more simple. And then, and then with that buy-in, it's, it's been easier, um, but it is something that it, it took five years really to, to get implemented. Trina, did you have anything to add on your maintenance scheduling and tracking program? No, I think I just can, um, say that we use Maximo for our work management system along with our GIS for spatial um, recognition and layout of where our facilities are. And between our Maximo program and our GIS, um, we've done a pretty good job at getting our facilities into um, a computer-based uh, software, but we're not at the step where we'd like to be out in the field with mobile technology for the crews to use with handheld devices that let them do easy reportable uh, fill-in uh, tracking. So we hope to get there soon. 
And I, I like to add to that a little bit. Um, I'm jealous of your, your, your situation, Drina. We don't have a stormwater utility in Spokane. Instead, it's our sewer maintenance crews that do the pipe and, and catch basins. And then it's our green area maintenance crews in the water department. So we're meeting our compliance requirements um, through multiple departments, where if we had a utility, I think it might be, it may be, I could be wrong, a little more simple to implement, um, such as you've impl implemented over there. Um, well, thank you. I might keep bragging and say that w along with our geographical information system mapping system, we also have implemented a generic table editor where we've been um, able to be pretty innovative with what we're putting into our GIS maintenance or our GIS um, software so that you can not only look at it spatially on a map, but when you click onto the assets, we're tracking multiple metrics and um, a significant amount of information so that when um, the end user wants to find information out about it easily. It's not only linked with our work management system that can tell you what maintenance has been done and where an inspection has been done. It can also tell you things about when was it established, what is the function of it, who was the funder of the project. So we continue to evolve on our um, metric and data tracking and where the goal is so that we can be more efficient in reporting out. And I'm really hopeful that eventually we'll get to a data dashboard that'll make it even more um, visually pleasing. Thank you. So a question popped up in the chat that I'll um, bring in in com combination with one we talked about before the panel, which is related to life cycle costs and estimating costs for operation and maintenance. And is there a, a method or a way your entity prefers to estimate O&M costs? Um, and the question from the, uh, one of the attendees is, and how do, planned costs compared to actual costs. Does somebody want to tackle that? Okay, I don't, I can, oh. go ahead, please. Oh, um, so here at the city of Seattle, we average about $2.40, has been pretty consistent when we are comparing our invoice costs to what our budget is cost. And we've been doing this over, I don't know, since 2007. We average about $2.40 a square foot for routine, uh, or I shouldn't say routine, but routine establishment costs, which includes, includes uh, the watering cost. And that includes hooking up to a hydrant and hand watering our facilities. So that's about $2.40 a square foot, but that's just for the vegetation maintenance. And then after three years, we considered it an established facility, although we do still occasionally maintain during periods of drought that that cost drops by about 25%. Um, that does not include the cost of your hardscape maintenance for inspections of your catch basins or your under drains or any of your pipes. And my recommendation on that is to think about if what crews are doing it. Like I said, we're kind of unique. We have different crews that do the work. So if, you're, if you know what your cost is to clean a catch basin, that's the same kind of cost you should probably expect to do with a, a green infrastructure um, facility. Um, so I do, uh, you know, we pay the conservation core minimum wage plus about two and a half percent markup on it. So it's hard for me to give a cost based on where you are and what kind of unions you have. But those are just some um, basic thoughts to think about. Trey? Well, so, uh, full life cycle cost is something that I think that perhaps industry-wide, stormwater industry-wide, we're still discussing. Uh, here in Spokane, we have this conversation quite often with the engineers and myself. How long is that swale gonna be viable? How long are we gonna be providing treatment for stormwater that becomes groundwater that then enters our aquifer? Um, there's not a lot of literature I'm aware of out there that projects 20 years out or that has studies uh, looking back 20 years. Um, I think strictly from a mass balance perspective and your water chemistry and soil chemistry perspective, you can probably estimate um, you know, a 20-year, um, lifetime of a swale, depending on your, your, your soil volume, soil depth. Um, but I'd be interested if someone could provide some um, studies that look backwards 20 years to look at lifetimes of, of BMPs. Um, I think it's still an active conversation. So we had another question that came in from um, one of the attendees and they wanted to know how you go about getting budget approval for additional staffing that's needed to meet new permit requirements. Somebody wanna take that question? I can maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, for us, it was it was hard at first when we first started our, our uh, private inspection program. Um, the the public side is, is 
uh, you know, similar, but I think it, it really took uh, assessing the, 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 the volume and trying to project out how many, how many new systems we're in, we anticipate seeing related, you know, to the development. And at least in our jurisdiction here, development has been just crazy. So um, we're approaching, uh, I would anticipate by the end of this next year, likely a, a thousand uh, vegetated facilities. And uh, we've done a couple things. I mean, number one, just projecting out the number of facilities you anticipate having is, is one thing you'd want to do uh, to try to reduce the amount of uh, resources we'd need. We've also gone to a more of a performance-based uh, assessment of the facilities to kind of evaluate and, and determine where our needs be placed uh, based on the condition of the facility itself. So we're, we're going through a study right now to try to uh, understand how many facilities we've got right now, the condition they're in, how often we have to return to re to reinspect them, and then uh, how many we anticipate having in the in the near future. So that that's one approach that that we're taking on right now to try to determine uh, the, the the number of staff we might need to uh, inspect and, and manage both on the private and public side. Thank you, Trey. Do you want to add to that? It's a little bit outside of my, my expertise here with the staffing piece. Um, I recognize the need for it, but being a municipality, I know it's it's um, it's almost literally an act of Congress uh, to get bring a full time employee on um, through all the civil service and uh, um, human resources department. So it's 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 not a small task. It's a very heavy lift to bring on a full time person, and so um, the justification needs to be strong and, and true and real. Um, and so, unfortunately, sometimes you have to have a non compliance to justify that. Um, if you can project out your needs far, you know, far enough, and you have the right documentation. Sometimes you can get through council, uh, but that's a, it's a very hard lift for a municipality to bring on extra extra employees. I think I might add that um, the challenge I think for us in the beginning to get maintenance dollars was the recognition that it wasn't a ditch with plants; it was a stormwater asset. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Jane. I think I think that's. That's a really key thing is helping. Nobody likes to buy things they don't either think they need or understand why they need them. Um, and and when it comes to hiring a full time employee, it, cities are rightfully so very trepidatious because that's on the books forever and that's that's a big expense. And none of us have excess budgets. We're, you know, there's there's no nobody sitting there with a huge surplus. Um, and so I think that that. That, that being able to show and talk about these things that way that yeah this this not just a this, these are these are facilities that are providing a critical function just like our wastewater treatment plant is just like our water treatment plant is these that, that these are in that same category these are ne necessary infrastructure this isn't luxury infrastructure this is necessary infrastructure and then i think one of the things that i found really helpful is to always conduct that internal audit and take a look and say okay am I maximizing what I have? Am I maximizing the, the employees that I have? Am I, am I efficient? Am I structured efficiently? And having those conversations, and I, I found it helpful to run through with whoever the deciding body is, whether it's a city council, an executive team, and just go through and show the process of, okay, you know, here was the need. We, this, is, this is why this is a need. And here's how we tried to meet it in all other ways before asking for stuff. We looked at doing it this way. We looked at doing it that way. We looked at having this person, do they have additional bandwidth? And we were able to put it down and so instead of asking for four new employees, I'm asking for two. I was able to find that, able to find half of it. I can't find this other half in any other way. I mean, just to, just to add on to that, I think somebody touched on an important piece here about uh, your, your city councils. You know, I, I don't, I can't speak for all of them, of course, but I think it's important to educate your councils or or board members as to the importance of uh, meeting permit conditions. Uh, you know, just the fact that they understand that there are permit conditions around these stormwater facilities, and the fact that they have to be number one, they have to be constructed, and then they have to be maintained long term is is critical in in terms of uh, trying to. Uh, justify additional uh, staff in the future. Thank you. 
So we're down to the last five minutes. Um, if For those attending, if you have questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll try to get to some of those. Um, one question I do have for you, um, open to anyone, is you know, any, can you share any lessons learned that you've uh, had during the COVID pandemic with respect to implementing your education and outreach and O&M programs? I can jump in and talk. Um, COVID taught us that unsheltered people aggressively have impacted our sites. And we saw a sharp increase to damage to the vegetation beyond recovery with significant trash and debris impacts that we are still unable to recover from. And we're working on evaluating those um, next steps. Uh, a couple other things were lack of maintenance on living systems are forgiving but will heal with time or most likely, but it's a, again, an effort of trying to um, have the patience for that to happen because we did see an increase in complaints when our stay home order was lifted, our citizens expected really prompt results. So there was a little bit of outreach that needed to be done by us and our staff. Um, and again, we're struggling with GSI lacked the understanding of a true stormwater asset and that vegetative work could be performed safely outside with socially distanced um, employees doing that work. So, um, it, so it wasn't considered, um, no, I can't think of the word. Um, it wasn't considered necessary work. Oh, what is that word anyway? Um, and so one of the list logistics was when we did return to work that the, the greatest challenge was that we could only have one person per vehicle. And somebody typed in the chat box, essential worker. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <Don't> even... <laughs> we were not considered essential work. So I feel like it's because it's not recognized um, completely as a stormwater uh, facility. Thank you. Tony, you want to add to that? Yeah, I just I just wanted to say, uh, you know, we'd had a, a we, we tried to get private property owners to respond to us uh, when we requested maintenance within about 30 days or so. Of course, it didn't happen all the time, but we, we, we try to pester them as much as we could to get that done. I think, I think now, um, understanding the economic impacts that COVID has had on uh, so many people that, you know, just showing some, some grace and understanding in, in terms of uh, the cost associated with maintenance with some of these facilities is important. So, you know, giving them time to, to create a, a plan and, a, and prepare a budget or something uh, instead of expecting that work's going to be done right now, um, I think is important. So we're not really pressuring folks to uh, go out, with, at least on the big ticket items, uh, especially the you know full on restorations of, uh, of, of their private facilities right now, rather than maybe deferring some of that. You know, as Drina mentioned, these these facilities are pretty resilient and. You know, as long as water, storm water is flowing through them, there is still some treatment that's occurring and, and focusing on, on, you know, I guess, long term and how we can work with property owners, you know, once, once, our, once things start to get somewhat back to normal, I think is important right now. Thank you. So I'm going to take one last question because we're just about out of time and I'm going to direct this to Tyler. Um, the question is, as a stormwater engineer in a small town that doesn't have city maintenance for right-of-way planters, but um, once GSI solutions for new development and right-of-way, what are, are there programs I can point to for the city to adopt to aid in the maintenance of funding GSI and right-of-way? Yeah, that's, I think that's really a tough thing. And I think that's something that that as we look forward really needs to be addressed. I think since the MS4s, since the permits were, were obviously targeted at big cities when they when it was rolled out and it's the big city and then it worked its way down and continues to work its way down. And we're a small, but we're still over 25,000 residents and we have some resources. Um, and as, as we continue to work down some of these smaller MS4s, I think that's really a challenge. And I, I wish I had a good answer for a lot of resources. I think there are increasing grants that are available, but I do think that that is still a big gap is, is having the resources available, one for education, uh, workforce, and then just, just for the facilities themselves. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that if there's a good answer out there that somebody has, I'd love to hear it too. Thank you. 
And I think we're out of time. I've been asked to turn this back over to Carrie. Thank you to all the panelists um, and to the attendees for your questions too. Excellent, thank you, Amy. And yes, thank you to all the presenters and moderators and all those behind the scenes who helped to bring this Stormwater Summit together. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for attending. Um, thank you to our gold sponsors, Brown and Caldwell, Corolla, Jacobs, Westios, Leeway Engineering Services, Sladen, HDR, Tetratech, and Kennedy Jenks, and our silver sponsors, Stantech and Parametrics. I know we didn't get to all your great questions, so please join us in our interactive networking activity to continue the conversation. And to click on the um, Zoom link that is now appeared in the chat window. And if you uh, have any specific questions or interested in the Stormwater Committee, um, please send me an email and uh, look forward to chatting with you all in the Zoom. For those who aren't able to make it, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.